Hi everyone, welcome back to Missy's Enchanted channel. Well, we are on part seven of True Tales of Ghostly Encounters. Yes, we're getting there. <laughs> so, let's get started. Dad's visit. My husband Joe and I have had several paranormal experiences during our lives, individually before we met and since our marriage 31 years ago. We are down to earth, common sense people not given the flights of fancy. Experiences are accepted as important faucets of our lives and sometimes the lesson to be learned from an encounter is not always clear at the moment it happens. This is an account of one experience I had. It was chilly Monday night in the fall and my husband was watching a football game on a TV set in our bedroom. While I sat in the living room watching a movie on another set, it was about 9.30 p.m. I had been watching a movie and dozed off, which I was prone to do occasionally. Upon waking, I saw it was a little after 10 o'clock. Having missed about 30 minutes of the movie I had planned to see, I decided to go to bed to read. I went into the bathroom and began removing my makeup and brushing my teeth. While bending over the sink, I had an uncontrollable urge to look into our living room where I had just been sitting 10 or 15 minutes earlier. I had heard no noise, nor had I reason to glance down the hall, except this almost uncontrollable need to look to my left. As I looked down our seven foot hall to the living room, I saw a man walking from our living room into our kitchen. He was wearing a short sleeve white shirt with dark trousers, and his head was bent slightly forward. I saw only the side view of the man. Why would Joe change his clothes this late in the evening, I thought. My husband had been dressed in a red shirt and blue jeans. I then walked to the bedroom where I had last seen my husband sitting, and behold, there he sat in a red shirt and jeans. I immediately jumped into the bedroom and sat on the edge of the bed. Joe said, what's the matter? You look like you've seen a ghost. I replied, I just saw a man walk from the living room into the kitchen. Joe jumped up from the chair and ran into the living room and kitchen to confront the intruder. I followed closely on his heels and said, It's all right. I know who it was. It was Les, I answered. My father, a former college and professional football player, had owned a family sports tavern in Grand Island, Nebraska. His work uniform was always a short sleeve white shirt and dark trousers. A tall man at six feet four inches, he often walked with his head bent forward, more of a habit of dealing with his bifocals than his height. I walked into the kitchen and looked, but no one was there. I looked around the entire kitchen, including upward toward the ceiling, and softly whispered, I'm glad you're here watching over me and taking care of us. I know we didn't always see eye to eye, but I always knew you loved me and hope you knew how much I loved you. We just had trouble saying the words to each other. I'm happy to see you. I then returned to my bedtime preparations. The day ended with special thoughts of my father, Les McDonald, who had died of a heart attack on July 26, 1971, some 25 early, well, 25 years earlier. I am happy, comforted, and secure in the knowledge that my father is watching over our family. As in life, he remains a man who does not speak the words of love, but he bestowed a rare gift to me of glimpse, glimpsing him for a moment. Thus reinforcing that he, he and my mother are always close at hand, watching over us and guiding us through life. The knowledge that my father was watching over me gave me untold strength during painful times when I felt very alone in my battle. And her name is Linda McDonald Williams, Nightingale, North Carolina, January 2000. That's good. She got to see her father one last time. I mean, I think that's awesome. All right, now we're going to be reading My Dead Returns. What I'm about to relate is not a product of belief. It is a product of experience. I present it to you as pure, unadulterated fact. My first son, Tommy, was 23 days old when my father, Thomas Orkney, was killed. He fell from a truck in Puget South Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, Washington, on May 11, 1956, and was instantly killed. Six months later, when my husband, Milan Pekka, was working the 12 to 8 a.m. shift 
I was awakened at three o'clock one morning by my infant son's crying. Assuming he was wet or hungry, I arose and stumbled toward the baby's crib across the room from my bed. To my amazement, I saw that the old-fashioned, black, enameled wooden rocking chair at the foot of my bed was rocking to and fro. I wondered if we were experiencing a minor earth tremor. As I approached the crib, I distinctly heard my father's voice say, Don't pick him up, Barbara. You only spoil him. He's neither wet nor hungry. He's teething and that makes him fussy. Let him cry a little and he'll go back to sleep. This scared daylights out of me. In one leap, I was back in my bed with the covers over my head. Was I losing my mind? But that was my father's voice, as clear and normal as if he were physically alive in the room with me. In the years that follow, I had two more children, Charlie and Therese. And then on November 22nd, 1967, my husband Milan Pekka died. In March 1968, I remarried and, hold on a second. And then had an additional addition to my own three children, three foster children, Gary Rose and Connie and Laurie Sidwaski. We rented an old farmhouse on the highway between Ray Raymond and P.L. Washington. The house had not been occupied for 15 years when we moved in, and we spent time fixing it and putting it in a garden. One evening when the garden had been in about six weeks, the children and I were home alone. My husband was working the swing shift, at about 9 o'clock, Gary, 15, went into the darkness of the kitchen for a drink of water. Mom, come quick, hurry, I heard him call. I put down my knitting and went to where Gary stood transfixed by something he saw outside the window. We had a lot of wildlife around the old farmhouse, and I assumed he was watching a coyote, a deer, an elk, or something of that kind. Look, Mommy whispered, out there by the garden. As I peered out, I could see the moon shining through the trees in the or orchid. And right at the end of the new garden stood the form of a man wearing a robe. It appeared translucent in the moonlight. That's just my dad, Gary, come to see how the garden's grow, and I said. The apparition immediately disappeared, and as I turned to leave the kitchen, I wondered why I had said that. For several months following that incident, the other five children made it a practice to get out of bed after dark and traipsed down to the kitchen for a drink of water, hoping to get a glimpse of Grandpa in the garden, but he never returned. The following year, we bought a 37-acre farm closer to the town of Raymond where my husband worked. One July evening in 1969, after my husband had gone to work and all the chores were done, I was playing the game ESP with the children. My youngest son, Charlie, suddenly rose from the table and walked to the center of the living room. After standing there for a few seconds, he asked, Mom, where's Grandpa? I explained for the upteenth time that his grandpa had died before he was born and, as far as I knew, was in heaven. But you said he'll be with us always, he retorted. Could he be right here in the room with us? I really don't know, son, I replied. I suppose he could. How would I know if he was here in the room? Becoming impatient with his line of questions, I retorted. Well, Charlie, I suppose you could ask him if he is here. And he did, gathering all the courage he could muster. Eight-year-old Charlie, hands on hips, asked, Grandpa, are you in this room with us? Nothing happened except a chill seemed to pass over us. Grandpa, Charlie demanded, if you're in this room with us, I want you to prove it. Now. At the opposite end of the living room was a plate glass window, eight feet wide and four feet high. I had hung curtains with a ruffle across the top at the window. As soon as Charlie had uttered his challenge, the ruffle began to quiver. It quivered progressively across the window from left to right. Instantaneously, there were five children in my lap. The cod table lay on its side, having been knocked over in the melee. All six of us witnessed the answer Charlie's grandpa gave him. He was there. I do not know what to expect in the future, but I do know there is life beyond the end of life here on earth because I have had experiences that prove it to me. And I even have five witnesses as to one of these experiences. Barbara L. Pekka, Vancouver, Washington, April, 1984. Hmm. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but like I said a thousand and one times, I do believe in life after death. 
has to be something out there, right, guys? I mean, it can't just be us. All right, let's see. I'm going to read one more. The Third Daughter. In January 1932, when the Depression was at its worst, I was a nurse doing private duty, which in those days meant working 12 to 24 hours at a stretch. People rarely went into hospitals when they were ill at the time, as hospital insurance was a rare commodity. When illness occurred, a nurse was called into the home. In this case, it was the mother who was ill. The rest of the family, including her husband and two unmarried daughters, each well past 40 years of age, the family was wealthy. The husband and brought his bride to the same home 52 years before. The place had been an orange ranch, then running from Figueroa Street to Western Avenue. It is now part of a southwest Los Angeles. In the early 30s, the home was old, but still lovely, with all the elegance of the bygone days. Since my shift was from from seven at night to seven in the morning, I was familiar with the many creaks and squeaks in the place. When they retired for the for the night, the family always wanted to be reassured that I would call them if any change occurred in the patient's condition. None of them ever looked in on us during the night. So complete was their confidence in me. This particular night, I had made my patient comfortable and then settled myself in a large chair, behind which was a floor lamp. Over this lamp, I draped a blanket. The light shone over my shoulder and onto my book only. As I sat reading, I heard someone come down the hall. She walked softly into the bedroom and came to stand at the foot of the mother's bed, resting both hands on the foot rail. She was turned away from where I sat with my book, and the room was only dimly lit. I did not see her face, but I could see she had clad in a white flannel light gown. It was old-fashioned with a yoke and a ruffle around the neck. The sleeves were long, went ruffles at the wrist. She was barefoot. I was not startled that one of the daughters would check on her mother during the night, although no one ever had done so before. Since it was January, I felt she should put on slippers and a robe. I started to tell her this, but as soon as I spoke, there was no longer anyone there. The figure had seemed solid enough. I never once thought that it was not one of the living daughters until the figure vanished. Later, I managed to learn in a roundabout way that none of the family had left their beds during the night, but I never mentioned this experience to any member of the family. Weeks later, I visited a friend whose landlady was another old-time resident of the neighborhood who knew this family. When I finished telling of my experience, this elderly woman said, there was a third daughter who died in her early 20s. Probably it was she who came to take her mother. This could have been the case for at dawn, my patient slipped away from this world. Her unknown visitor had come at one o'clock that same morning. Wow. Kind of scary, but I don't know. I mean, it's comforting that, you know, if you're about to pass or something, someone can come and get you. I don't know. What do you guys think? Vivian F. Roberts, R.N. Bell, California, July 1964. That's all I'm going to be reading. I'm just going to be reading three today. Kind of tired from work today, but I definitely want to know what you guys think about these, you know, the two tales of ghostly encounters, you know, if you believe them or I don't know, just your thoughts on them if you want in the comments. And I'll talk to these guys in a couple of days. I don't know if it's going to be this or if it's going to be something else. We'll see what happens. All right, guys, stay safe, have fun. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching. Bye. Mwah. See you later.